Welcome, Chris Perkins, back to Dragon Talk. Hi, Chris. Hello. Yay. I feel like it's been, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks since we last chatted. It I has know. indeed. Weird. Yes. You just keep putting out so many great products. We just have to keep having you back on. <sighs> and then when they're out for a little while, then we put them out again. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> We know that's your strategy, just to keep getting invited back to Dragon Talk. Oh, that, yeah, right. I give myself all this extra work just so I can get invited. Oh, maybe now they'll invite Onto your me show. Back. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, seconds before we started recording, you said that you look pale. I say, maybe vampire-y? Vampiric. Vampire-y. <laughs> I say vampire-y. Okay. Yeah. Tomato, tomato. But yes, uh, yeah, maybe. Irish. Yeah. Yeah. The nice straw nice like, of nice the Seattle added. tan. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It reminds me of when, uh, and I mentioned this in the intro, that you uh, dressed up as Mr. Count, not Mr. Count. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Count. Mr. Very Count informal. himself. Mr. Drod, no. Uh, Mr. Zerovich, better. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Z? Mr. Z? Z? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. That was, Z. That, that, that was a million years ago. That was at a TwitchCon, like, yes. what, three years ago? It was, yeah. Right. Full costumes for everyone, uh, and you... Uh, I think had uh, the most intricate costume out of everyone, uh, looking not not like the cursive straw that's on the cover, uh, not the cursive straw, not like the, the straw that's on the cover, but a straw that's uh, in an interior illustration. Yes, yes. Although the costume uh, grossly overestimated my waistline, so the pants kept falling down. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about that? Like when I was having the costume fitting. Is this going to be like another you in a robot costume? Are <laughs> 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 unable to get up off the sidewalk? Oh. So, it kind of. So I'm, I'm, I'm in my full strad makeup and hair and all the bit. I'm heading out to the stage. And to get there, you had to walk through the kitchen of the convention center. I don't okay. know if, ever, if you were there, Shelly, or not. No, I wasn't. Yeah, to get from the dressing rooms, you had to walk literally through the kitchen. And um, my pants fell down right in the middle of the kitchen with all the kitchen staff <laughs> um, preparing. Uh, just staring at me with my pants down. Oh my god! Looking like and a vampire with a sword. With my Seattle right. tan, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so I just basically had to shuffle back to the dressing room with my pants around my ankles. Uh, and you didn't then pull them, them up and have them basically safety pinned. Oh my god! Uh, in place. That you know is what? amazing. When I play Curse of Strahd now. I'm going to, when I encounter Strahd, I'm going to think about them and be like, I bet he has safety pins in his pants and he's not that scary anymore. <laughs> I, love, I just love that your pants fell down in the kitchen and yeah. everybody's and, like, and they just like dropped. They didn't like just inch down. They just <laughs> poof, right to the floor. Like, like clown pants? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Man. Wow. Now I hope this leads to people who are going to play Curse of Strahd revamped and uh, their goal will be to pants Strahd uh, yes. at some point. Curse of Strahd repants. Repants. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to kill him. We'll or, see you in two years. You know, to talk liberate about that Barovia yes. from the hands of a dread vampire lord. No, <laughs> we just want to tailor. embarrass him. Yes. Extra points if you can do it in the kitchen. Yes, that's how you shame Strahd. You pants him. Yeah. <laughs> well, isn't it all about like he's, you know, he's having dinner and you're invited? So now yeah. I really just picture him like going to his kitchen staff and just screaming at them and his pants fall down around his ankles. Yeah. yeah. And everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and then he kills them all. Right. Or every time you encounter him, he's just not wearing pants. Like he's sitting at the dining room table, but he's not wearing his pants. Right. He's, <laughs> I mean, thank you. He's playing, he's, playing, he's, he's playing the organ, not wearing pants. That changes the whole cover image here that I'm looking well, at. Well, yeah. Then it starts getting very Sharon Stone at that point. Like he's not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, look closely at his face. He looks like he's saying, mm -hmm. ouch, <laughs> the safety pin is came undone <laughs> and is poking me in the butt cheek. <laughs> Very so ungratified. I think we, we've just done yeah. a really great job of making Strahd a, a very serious villain <laughs> by <laughs> pantsing him and talking about his pants being safety pinned. 
He had to go to his mom. And we say that, of course, because he's he's obviously one of the most terrifying villains. Clearly. That, uh, you know, that's why this is all so very funny. And one of the reasons why I think, Chris, you added so much humor into this adventure was that if you're just going to be terrifying vampire uh, and all of this dread and awfulness in Barovia going on, uh, it can get very one note and very samey. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember having a conversation with uh, Tracy about that um, because there was humor in the original Ravenloft adventure, but most of it was saved for the the catacombs at the end of Ravenloft. And I was curious about whether that was by design or whether Ra- Tracy and Laura just got to the end of the adventure and were so tired they started to get really silly. Um, but it was deliberate. It was an attempt to diffuse the horror. Um, and uh, in order to build horror, of course, you have to have these sort of highs and lows of emotion. You have to put people off their guard. And one way you can do that is through humor. And then of course, build up the horror again. Um, and so it was a very deliberate attempt in Curse of Strahd to seed more bits of horror, or more bits of humor through the adventure at certain points in times um, to keep it from becoming monotonous. Right. So urban legend says that over a Christmas break of about two weeks or so, while most of us were off eating sugar cookies and drinking wine and watch, watching Bravo television, um, you went off and wrote this adventure. I went off and wrote the first stuff. draft, yeah. And it took about three weeks. Uh, and that was including uh, retyping out the original Ravenloft adventure. What? Um, because we didn't have digital files. You retyped the original adventure? Yeah. Because the original adventure is basically contained within Curse of Strahd. Um, so that was all done over that period of time. So what What was it? I mean, three weeks seems quick for a first draft, yes? It is, un, uh, unnaturally so. But I felt at the time I was so, um, I don't want to use the word obsessed because that's a little too heavy, but I was deeply, deeply invested in proving that um, we could do something really interesting with that old adventure and kind of build around it and release a product that um, kind of uh, took the story as its framework and then expanded it in interesting directions to make Strahd even more fearsome to create more of a a full campaign feel. Okay. Yeah. So I I do remember hearing like, or maybe you had even told me that you were just like, had very focused very inspired by this or it was yeah Ravenloft has always been the original Ravenloft which came out in 1983 was always one of my favorite adventures because Strahd was such a rich villain and because the setting was so lush and uh, vibrant and well detailed and the castle was just amazing um, that uh, it was it was always on my radar uh, with fifth edition when I was working on the monster manual and writing the vampire entry and making sure there was an image of Strahd's castle in the monster manual, it was always my intention to try to do something interesting with Ravenloft going forward. I had also worked with Tracy once before on a Dragonlance project and was really, really eager to be able to work with him again um, in some capacity. So I was committed. And we spoke to uh, you and Tracy and uh, I believe Laura actually joined the conversation too uh, an early episode of Dragon Talk back in 2015 uh, about your meeting. Uh, and it was really fascinating. If you guys, you know, obviously longtime listeners will remember that, but definitely go back and, and revisit that interview if you're interested. But one of the things that struck me out was that, uh, struck out to me during that conversation was that this adventure was a departure from the adventure writing that came before it. And many people kind of say like, oh, this adventure was a jumping point uh, jumping off point for all adventures that had been written in Dungeons and Dragons going forward. Can you talk a little bit about about why that was so in your thoughts? Yeah, so prior to the release of Ravenloft in the 80s, um, adventures in D&D were largely dungeon crawls. Uh, and that was how people assumed kind of D&D adventures should be designed, that essentially you have, uh, you know, the characters have a, a threadbare plot that gets them to this big, place that they have to explore and they just sort of go room through room for room plowing through it getting treasure and then bailing um and what what sort of uh intrigued tracy and laura was the idea of having a more multifaceted story kind of drive the action and have the have the villain be the thing around which the story orbits instead of just a dungeon 
Um, part of it stems from the fact that uh, uh, Tracy felt that previously vampires were just treated like any other dungeon monster. You know, you find a tomb, there's a vampire, you kill it, you take its stuff, you move on. Uh, there's no, there's no real dimension to the vampire. And uh, because the vampire embodies so many, it's sort of like an amalgamation of so many myths and touchstones and latent fears and uh, superstitions uh, in all sorts of societies uh, throughout the world. Uh, Tracy and Laura felt that they could really mine the vampire myth and really sort of dig, sink their teeth into it, as it were. Uh -huh. and, and give the vampire the, the justice it deserved, an entire adventure of its own. And out of that, Ravenloft arose, um, and Castle Ravenloft, uh, the big, this sort of massive edifice that many people have died in now, um, also kind of arose out of that. It was, uh, it was, interesting, unchar uh, it was uncharted ground. Yeah, and speaking of charts, the, the map of Castle Ravenloft was isometric and it had three floors on it, which I think was also a first for a Dungeons and Dragons adventure. We had right? never seen a map rendered that way uh, of a location in a D&D adventure before where it was this uh, 3D perspective and you could see all the levels and how they connected to one another um, at a glance. I mean, it made, it made you know, redrawing maps as a dungeon master very challenging, but it was instantly immersive you got the location, you got its sense of scale and scope and just how fantastic this place is. Um, it, it begged exploration. Yeah, and I think a lot of people latched yeah. onto that yes. uh, image as well as the image of the vampire. Uh, yes, that is exactly. Did you know in the original Ravenloft there were no bathrooms? Just like the house on the hill in Betrayal at House on the right? Hill. Right, yeah. Probably um, the same builder, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that, that, that very well could be. Um, and uh, one of the things that I uh, talked to Tracy about, because um, I'm, you know, I've always been interested in architecture. If I hadn't been a game designer, I probably would have been an architect. I could but, see that. Um, or, a, or a political speech writer, one of those two things. I could see that. But, very similar. Uh, one of the other things that was not lost on me, and it was a conscious thing about uh, the design of Castle Ravenloft, is once you get inside it, it starts to almost make no sense that you uh, the way staircases connect to levels and the way things are laid out is specifically designed to disorient <gasps> creatures inside of it. So they lose track spatially of where they are in the castle. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was all deliberate. And so people often wonder, who built this place and why did they build it like this? This makes no sense. You have to go up, then down, then across, then up again, even higher, and then back down to get to this place that's right above this other place. It's like, yes, it's, it's by design. It's there to torture the people who, who are, you know, wandering around inside of it. If you're Is a it? vampire, you're a bat. You don't care. You can fly from one window to the next and get yes, around. As, as the crow flies or the yeah. bat in this case. Is, um, is it a conscious choice to not have a bathroom? Because that, that can really mess with people. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, one assumes that when this castle was built, I think chair, chamber pots were probably in vogue. Mm. Oh, in vogue. You just throw your chamber pot, you know, off the uh, off the balcony or the, the wall and call it good. You know, yeah. Or, or a servant does. You don't, you don't have, well, you know, Castle Ravenloft is surrounded by big towering walls. So you could walk out onto the battlements of a wall and throw it off a cliff, basically. Um so I assume that's how they handled it back in the day. But of course now, Strahd being a vampire doesn't need to poo. So he doesn't care that there's no bathrooms. <laughs> but he has guests all the time. He's having well, they dinner. Well, they don't leave. He has guests, but they never leave. <laughs> and, and it's not their comfort he's concerned with. No, definitely not. They're there just, you know, to be fed upon or locked in tombs and used to feed his brides. Now I've got Hotel California playing. I, have, I went there too. <laughs> it's a good soundtrack for when you're running Ravenloft. Uh, so that was a, uh, really great release in 2015. It's hard to go back that far, but it was the first. Actually, I think it came out in 2016. Did it? Yeah, I think oh, so. Oh man, now I'm really messing up. I keep but it was saying. the first half of the year, um, because in 2016 we released two stories, this one and Storm King's Thunder. Yeah, this one, Curse of Strahd originally released in March 2016. 2016, 2016. excellent. Uh, so, uh, what was the... Uh, impetus to kind of go back and you know kind of kind of try to create this deluxe box. What what, what kind of cool stuff uh, were you excited to kind of see put into you mean Curse of Strahd? Deluxe box, yes. The coffin shaped Ooh. box. 
I wouldn't have done it if we didn't get the coffin shaped box, by the way. The smart. I think I putting said, Yeah, you really I'm needed. Out. Yeah. In fact, I think it was the coffin shaped box that kind of sold initially people just on the concept of taking an adventure and repackaging it. I do remember talking about this coffin shaped box, which seems like years ago. Yes. It wasn't. I mean, it, it in fact was that. probably at least two years ago. Yeah, it actually probably was two years ago. Yeah, yeah. That's when the conversation would have started. Yeah. Uh, so what prompted us to do it? Well, I always felt that with Curse of Strahd, like with Ravenloft, cards, the cards, the Taraka deck. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean? Was, yes, those. <laughs> so beautiful. Those cards are such an intrinsic part of the adventure experience that they were really always meant to be together because for those who don't know you use the taraka deck to randomly determine where certain things are in the adventure where strahd is uh where where basically where you have your final showdown with him where you can find um a treasure that can be used to defeat strahd all that kind of stuff um so so, sorry is it the dungeon master who is the one who's using the taraka deck Yes. Okay. But it's done out in the open. Okay. So the dungeon master lays out cards randomly in the open, and that determines things that the players can then use to to deal with Strahd. But um, previous, when we released Curse of Strahd as a book, of course, we couldn't sell the cards along with it. So we partnered with Gale Force 9 to release the deck, and you could mm-hmm. then buy them separately and use them together. But I felt that the ideal package would be to be able to put the cards and the adventure into one place. So you get both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then um, once we committed to the idea of actually doing that, then the question becomes, what else do we put in the box to create a fun experience for the DM? And what else did you put in the box? I know we've kind of talked about it, Greg and I, but... Let's yeah, we've uh, yeah. Um, people who have seen the IGN unboxing video have probably seen uh, the components. But uh, I think the next thing we talked about was uh, breaking up the adventure into smaller pieces. Yeah. Right. So, for instance, uh, putting the monsters in a separate book. That way, the DM can keep the adventure open and then look at the monsters mm-hmm. without having to flip back and forth in the same book. Yeah. That's and so really that was nice. a better experience. And then, of course, we wanted the poster map to be in there, uh, Barovia and the castle as a separate piece. Uh, We wanted the handouts that appeared in the back of the book originally to be separate things that the DM can just hand out. So basically loose leaf sheets of paper. And then conversations started to go around, well, apart from just breaking up the adventure and its components into separate elements, what other fun things can we put in? There, we had a long list, like about 50 or 60 different things, some of which had to be thrown out simply from a production point of view. What, what others from a, others from, so from a production point of view, um, one of the ideas was a straw puppet. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, in order to produce it, it would have been problematic. And then there are all kinds of um, uh, protocols surrounding things like cloth types yeah. and yeah. safety and things like that. Like you can't have things with um, pins or staples or anything in them, uh, anything like that. So right. that became, uh, we also talked about, let's put us a wooden stake in there. Well, no, because that could actually be used to stab someone. <laughs> uh, we talked about, um, you know, putting in uh, wax seals, uh, you know, with the Ravenloft stamp on it, but there are issues surrounding rubber and what kinds of rubber we can use. And, you know, uh, you know fashioning anything out of wood is tricky. Right. Um, so we talked about a bunch of stuff like that and then settled on a few actually useful gimmicks, things that we know players, uh, DMs might use, the postcards being one of them. Um, so the, we came up with this idea of putting in a set of 12 postcards with different art that the DM could basically send out to players like invitations to mm-hmm. the game. Um, and then we tried to figure out, well, what art will we put on it? What style of art? Well, we wanted kind of a poster card style artist to do that work. And then when we realized uh, uh, that that art could work just as well on the outside of a DM screen, that's when we decided to throw a DM screen in too. 
Oh, um, oh, cool. And, and have a DM screen that on the outside has the same art as the poster cards, as the poster um, cards, postcards. Yeah. And then on the inside have stuff tailored for the adventure. So the DM can have easy access to information that would otherwise be hard to find in the book. I like that um, as a non-dungeon master. But if I were a dungeon master, I would appreciate having the DM screen that is tailor-made for the adventure that I'm running. So that's a that's a good call. But I also like as a player to be able to see art that represents the location yeah. that I'm in. Yeah. And the the art has a very distinctive style, which I really it's like. Really cool. was, I'm very, very happy um, with. So the art, the artists who did it, they go, they they're known collectively as couple of kooks. <laughs> K-O-O-K-S. Oh. Perfect. So couple, of kook, couple of kooks did the art, which makes sense for this adventure. And the slogans are really fun too. Yeah, I came up with those. Of course you did. You, did? you yeah. wrote those? Oh yeah. Yeah. See, that could if you weren't a game designer, you could also be a, a travel uh you could work for a, a chamber of commerce and, and write travel brochures. <laughs> so yeah, many, many times. Too dark because, you know, they'd be going through the mail, so we don't want to spook our mailmen. Or mailmen. No, no, definitely not. Yeah. He'd be like, yeah. what is this place? This sounds amazing. I'm going right. to call my wife right is now. This, is this old bone grinder a real place? Like, can I actually go here? I'm excited. It's a tourist attraction, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. They're really cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I think uh, there is something to creating this like atmosphere, right? That's kind of important for, well, I guess for all D&D adventures, but it's specifically about this one because you are doing a different specific flavor of Dungeons & Dragons when you play Curse of Strahd. And so having these little uh, artifacts and pieces of art and DM screens that transport you into uh, that kind of mindset, I think really help bring the, the story to, to life. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And then the one other thing, um, the, the one other component is there is a surprise that when you first open the box, the first component you see is a bit of a surprise. I won't talk about it anymore. Wasn't now. expecting to see you here. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so the, the first of all, I call it Taroka deck, but I heard you say it differently. That's correct. Okay. Um, Taroka, Taraka. Tomato, tomato. It's called the whole Vampire thing. Vampire, vampiric, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these are, you have to use these in the adventure. Well, you can swap them out for a normal deck of cards, but yeah, you'll need a deck okay. of cards of some kind. So I've been playing with them. Can I, can I give you a reading? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, we can't, I don't, normally I would have you cut the deck, but. Do I'm I need gonna, to translate or what? Oh, I, have my, gonna, I have my. my just, book. Oh, you're gonna wing it. Good. All right. I got my it. my Taroka deck book right here. Oh, sweet. Okay. okay. Give me a number one through five. Four. Okay. You got the Seer card. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, hang on. I don't know them by heart, but <laughs> um, I actually. Um, I like this game. Yeah, okay. it's gonna be fun. Inspiration and keen intellect. We were just talking about how inspired you were to write this. And True obviously enough. we know you're very, very smart. Yes. A future event, the outcome of which will hinge on a clever mind. <gasps> and you were telling us before we started recording what you're working on. I know. It came true. It's true. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> Shelly, are you The cards know one? all. I have been practicing. The cards yes. know all. They do. They do. So... Uh, you can find me on Elkai Beach this summer <laughs> doing some readings. <laughs> Only from a Taroka card deck. I take Venmo and... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I love the yes. artwork uh, that accompanied the each of the cards for the Taroka deck. Chuck Lukash uh, did a fantastic yeah. job. Yeah, the Chuck, we almost, we almost broke Chuck with the Taroka deck because coming up with... 54, you know, iconic snapshots of things. Um, once you get to like 48, 49, you're just probably ready to be done. And I know that at the, the last few, Chuck was just like grinding. Um, there was no rubber left. What, uh, what was that process like? Were you, you wrote the art descriptions for each one of those? Uh, so it was, it was even simpler than that. Um, we... We gave Chuck the old deck mm. because there was, a, there was an, a second edition to rock a deck that had some different imagery um, just so we'd have that. 
then we gave him sort of uh, like a like one liners and then he just worked off of that so the, and then and then some ground rules like for instance when you're dealing with the cards in the various suits you have to make sure that there's the right number of swords in the illustration like the seven of swords has seven swords in it oh uh, yeah they can be worked in in different ways but they all have to be there so the trick for us when we got the art back was just actually counting to make sure that there were the right number of everything, the right number of glyphs, the right number of swords, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's like every time I see a beholder now, I have to be like, one, two, three, count the number of eye stocks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, so, and, the uh, raven is still the raven. my favorite. The raven I love the so raven. Good. Yes. I just, it's just so evocative. I just Agreed. Don't. Agreed. We yes. used that as a cover for Dragon Plus, if I remember yeah. correctly. Back, we did it. We did a different version of it for the cover, actually. It had the ampersand in, yeah. in, its, in its mouth. You I got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah these yeah. are these are beautiful. Yeah. So having those like oversized Taroka deck cards is a selling point in this anyway. But they're also foil stamped, aren't they? Yes, exactly. They are. Yes. I don't know if you can see it well. It's hard. It's hard to see the foil on on camera, but it's there. That's it's so there. gorgeous. Delightful. And the cards, the cards are bigger too. We enlarged them for this, um, for the over forty players. <laughs> <laughs> well, just so that they also just look more impressive when you lay them down for they the really card do. reading. They really um, do. Yeah, so they're they're bigger than the the versions that we released previously. So, so as cool. I was saying with uh, with Shelley in our intro for this, uh, it's we're in the throes of fall right now. I mean, there's skeletons everywhere in uh, West mm -hmm. Seattle. Uh, lots yeah. of spiders already making their spider webs without even the fake spider webs going out. I know. Pumpkins. It's true. I have I have a spider who's nestled in my portico. He's been there for or she's been there for three weeks now. Yeah, yeah. and it says uh, splendid on the. <laughs> in, <laughs> That's yeah. some pig. That's some pig. <laughs> <laughs> we own a pig spider. <laughs> <laughs> so rude, man. Yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of people like to put, roll, roll out uh, Curse of Strahd or at least do a one shot uh, around yeah. it. What uh, what kind of advice would you give for people who uh, are excited to get Curse of Strahd revamped and and delve into it during this very Halloweeny period of time? Be be careful with candles. Um, get candles that you can't accidentally knock over easily. <laughs> Because <laughs> in, in the throes of a D&D game, people get excited and yeah, arms start flailing. Go everywhere. Yeah, if you've got mood candles lighting things up, you don't want to knock those flying and have wax all over your keyboard. Well, <laughs> that, that could be how you get your wax stamp if you really want yeah. that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Make, it, make your own. Yes. And, I mean, that's with, with, with Halloween approaching, uh, this is obviously a great adventure to play, but it's always, it's always wise to remember that you know, in a spooky adventure, you know, make sure that the players are having fun, um, that that nobody's getting so spooked out that, you know. So on a scale of one to ten, one, I don't know, being like a, a, a Real Housewives um, episode and ten being like Poltergeist. Or like, mm -hmm. To me, that was the scariest movie ever. How scary do you think this is? Oh, this? Yeah. Um, so... I think it it largely depends on how how moody the DM makes it. Okay. Um, if you, you can you can sort of desaturate the horror a bit, uh, and just kind of run things or or try to or emphasize uh, things a little in a way that's a little bit differently. Like, and there are funny quirk, lots of funny quirky characters who you can either play as kind of dark and sinister or more uh, sort of weird and, and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Adam's family-esque? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Quirky. Like cousin, cousin it and yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, you could easily do an Adam's family vibe to a Curse of Strahd game okay. if you wanted to, um, where the camp is always kind of surfacing. Wow, what was that? <laughs> do you have a monster in your room, Shelley? It's there puppy. It's I'm, puppy. I'm gonna open the door and let him out because I was telling sounds. Greg before he he's having some digestive issues oh, today. Oh yeah, he's giving Please. you a sign. Yeah, yeah, he's like, there's some things happening that uh, it, it's like foreshadowing of horror, right? You want to be able to make let people know that there's exactly signs now. Out. One of my one of the things that I've done at conventions and things mm -hmm. is run Curse of Strahd, where the character where the characters 
uh, the, the game begins with the characters waking up in Strahd's study and they haven't got anything on except like their sleeping garments and all their Been gear there. is gone. And it's all about just getting out of the castle alive. I think that's another, another thing you can do with this adventure is just sort of start the characters in a precarious spot and just see how they do in the next three hours. You know, can they get out of the castle in one piece without their swords, without their spell books, without their, you know... I'm going to go with no. They, they get to improvise, you know, they, you know, suddenly they're walking around like Scooby-Doo characters with like candlesticks in their right. hands. Right. Where, you know. Yeah. That's a fun way to do it as a one shot. You know, if people don't want to uh, invest in doing an entire campaign, because there is a lot of content here. Like that's one thing that's yeah. uh, important to note uh, from the 16 pages that was in I-6 uh, the Ravenloft adventure. You've expanded it to uh how many pages is this? Now I'm, I'm calling myself out. Is that 256? I think so, yeah. Don't mind my dog, Milo. Oh. He, he's he's oh, growling. We love Milo. He's growling at the garbage trucks. <laughs> garbage oh, trucks. Yeah, our garbage day today, too. Yeah. How dare they. Neighborhood. <laughs> well, they're taking your stuff, basically. So Yeah, he's, yeah he yeah. doesn't like that. <laughs> he's like, that's my food. That's what I eat. <laughs> that's, I eat that stuff. It's, it's my crap. Get <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's there's a lot to explore, right? Barovia is is not just uh, Castle Ravenloft. Uh, there is a yeah. lot of of things and lots of stories and plots that you can right. or cannot interact with, depending on how you go. Right? And it also depends on how what the card draw is. Like if the random card draws point you in certain locations, that means you avoid other locations that you might not get to play the first time around. Oh, replayability. So replayability is a huge part of both adventures, the original and the Curse of Strong. Yeah. Yeah. So being able to, uh, you know, do this four years later after you might've run it in 2016, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a great way to revisit it. And you'll probably have, I mean, like you would with any D and D campaign It's completely, I said this in the intro, but you know, it's, it's, it's really fun yeah. to kind of go down there that road again and see what different notes hit. Oh, absolutely. And that's part of the reason why like, even Tracy Hickman runs it as an annual event for his family and friends is because every time you run the adventure, you get kind of a different outcome or you can play Strahd a little differently. You know, um, the circumstances, the reasons, the place where you encounter Strahd and sort of the reasons why he's behaving the way he is and all that can kind of change time after time. I remember Tracy describing to us uh, one of his experiences running the adventure where the characters finally confronted Strahd in his parents' tomb, and he was just sort of—he had thrown himself bodily and like on his mother's coffin, and was just weeping for oh. her. And how sympathetic Strahd was in that moment. Yes. Um, and how that lulled the characters into a false sense of security. <laughs> That's a good tactic. It worked on me. I was like, "Oh, oh poor you Strahd, a tissue. <laughs> you poor boy." Take all like, my no, blood. He's just—he's just bad. He's—he's—he's he's, he's horrible. But he is kind of charming, too. Well, that's the thing about vampires is they can turn on the charm when they have to, but it's all part of the game, right? Yeah. I, this is, I'm, I would not fare well in Barovia. <laughs> yeah. It's a, is it, do you find it a challenging uh, villain or adventure to run <laughs> because of that? Like, because you have to be manipulative in a way? Uh, it, yeah, it can be, it can also be, I know it can be frustrating for the characters when Strahd uses his full bag of tricks and escapes over and over and over again. It's like, can't we just nail this guy down? Um, he's always taken off in bat form or gaseous form or wolf form or whatever and leaving us high and dry. Oh, but the paladin's just been bit on the neck. That's great. Um, (laughs) so, uh, there can be both elements of not only terror, but also frustration when dealing with a vampire. And you kind of have to buy. Yeah, kind of have to buy into that. I think as a player, is like, okay, he's he's our arch nemesis in this adventure. Obviously, he's going to be a hard guy to pin down, and obviously, we're going to find ourselves at our wits' end um, dealing with him if he's being played right. I think uh, the least satisfying Chris of Strahd story is, you know, Strahd knocks on your door at the, you know, in the ta- in the tavern <laughs> or whatever at the. The, the the village and you just kill him on the spot. That would be sort of anticlimactic. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like I guess we don't need to go to that big castle after all. Right. <laughs> he well, came to us. Moment. He delivered the adventure to us. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that was is, easy. Is it fair? I always feel like, <coughs> excuse me, that it's cheating a little. But is it fair to, um, like, 
as a player, you know what your dungeon master is going to run for you. And you probably know your, there's a vampire. Right. <laughs> so, like, I, can you just, like, how how do I best build a character for going into this adventure? Is that fair? Or is that cheating to, to build your character? Based I think on it's that? fair going into Curse of Straw to build your character with the end game in mind that you're going to be fighting undead, and and prepare accordingly. I mean, you're basically reli- you're basically doing the D and D version of Dracula, right? And if you're playing a you know a Van Helsing vampire hunter, that's okay. The story expects that to be represented. Um, I think that you want to have a cleric in the party. That's not being meta. That's just being, right. that's just living up to the expectations of what a D&D adventure with a vampire requires. Okay. Yeah. If you don't have a, if you don't have a cleric who can heal or turn undead, then you're just, you're kind of going into this adventure like, like idiots. Like you're, you might, you're well playing, for you might as well be playing the Goonies at that point. You're just going to. Which would be very fun. Yeah. I could see I could see a DM with a lot of work taking sort of the essence of Curse of Strahd and having it be more like a Scooby Doo or Goonies style of experience where it's a, it's a little bit more player friendly. Like maybe you don't have to slay the vampire; you can just like unmask him. Yeah, or 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 do the thing like put the put the sacred relic on his coffin so that he's like banished to his coffin and can't get out. You know, things like that. That'd be fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, different characters and NPCs uh, in here, as, as there is in every adventure, but a lot of them uh, I think are pretty evocative. Uh, what, what are, I mean, uh, I might be just softballing this to you, but I know Blinsky's Toys uh, is, a, is a soft spot for your, for, in your heart. Yeah. So um, in the original Ravenloft, there weren't a lot, there wasn't a lot of space to flesh out characters. So there was like, Irina, the woman that Strahd was tormenting, there was um, a character named Leif, who was Strahd's accountant, this tortured man living in the castle with this vampire. And then there was this um, um, this sort of Igor-like creature. In creating Curse of Strahd, we wanted to expand the number of characters in Barovia dramatically. Blinsky was a really good one. That Blinsky was born out of our meeting uh, uh, during a meeting when Tracy was actually on site with us in a brainstorm room and we were just coming up with ideas to expand upon the adventure. And I don't remember who proposed it, but it was obvious one of the tropes of horror is the is the toy maker or the, the toys that come alive, you know, marionettes that talk and living mm-hmm. dolls and, you know, Chucky and all these uh, re- things, they come up in horror movies all the time. And so... We, we like the idea of having a toy maker figure somewhere into the story. And it was during the brainstorm session when we we're actually fleshing out the name of the toy maker. And it was Tracy who hit upon the name Belinsky. And it was myself who uh, came up with the catchphrase, is no fun, is no Blinsky. And I, I knew I had it right when Tracy just was laughing his <laughs> ass off uh, in the meeting uh, when I said it because... Um, uh, we were talking about the idea that this catchphrase would keep coming up in the adventure. Like you'd find toys scattered around that children would leave behind or would just be lying on the floor somewhere. And you'd always be able to identify it's a Blinsky toy by this little sewn in tag, which says is no fun is no Blinsky. Oh my uh, God. That's adorable. Uh, and then uh, only, only when I started writing the adventure, did we start to, re- did I start to really sort of flesh out the character and give him this little monkey and a ballerina tutu companion named Piccolo. Uh, who basically is his his only friend? Um, Aww. Yeah, I felt that Blinsky needed something to bounce off of in his shop, totally. and having this little monkey cavorting around the shop seemed like a really good fit. And I've always been fond of sort of um, hurdy gritty monkeys. Yeah, you know, I figured the story could use one. And those are creepy too. I mean, the 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 whole evil monkey has a is a trope unto itself. Yeah, the whole clapping symbol monkey. Yeah. keeps you know, I mean, that, ever, that the Wizard of Oz kind of ruined monkeys for me. Mm. So I Flying just think, monkeys. Yeah, yeah, they are kind of yeah. evil anyway. I know. Even us talking about it in this way, I keep seeing Shelley be like, "Ooh, ooh, creepy toys." I know. Well, you brought me back to Poltergeist again. Remember when he hooked <laughs> under the bed? And, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. 
but obviously in Curse of Strahd, we got to we got to sort of range a little bit beyond the vampire motif um, and really get into some of the other gothic tropes. Like there is a there's a part of the story that has a very bride of Frankenstein feel to it, for instance. Mm. Um, there's another part of the story that's very much like a the haunted crumbling mansion. The haunt, you know, um, there's the there's the haunted wizard's tower, there's the werewolf stuff worked into the story that wasn't emphasized before. So we we pretty much we tried to plumb the depths of gothic horror tropes and insert those into Barovia where appropriate uh, so that we're sort of covering the full universal monster spectrum in a way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It does feel like it is uh, old tiny horror. You know, it's like that idea of like the, the way that horror used to be portrayed still has, you know, the same kind of things that makes us our, our skin crawl, but it dev, it does have that, you know, backwards looking kind of feel to it, which I think makes it even creepier somehow mm -hmm. that history yeah, it, it, it feels like you're stepping back in time. Um, and I think that's important. Um, it, it takes you back to a more sort of Gothic slash Victorian period, which, you know, you just, you, you just understand on some level that people, people were less equipped to deal with that kind of thing back then. And so there is this sort of romanticism that kind of surrounds that period of time and the, the, the fact that um, you the 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 monsters feel a little bit more primal, mm. um, and they feel uh, a little bit a little bit more tethered to humanity because you know vampires and werewolves are reflections of humanity. They're sort of the embodiments of the worst traits of humankind you know, the, 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 the savage uh, creature that lives inside of us or the, the suave, deceitful, blood-drinking um, uh, figure who sort of embodies um, sexuality uh, in a dark way. Um, those, they're all just mere reflections of what the worst aspects of humanity are. Mm. I think when you get to more modern horror, you start to divert, you start to get away from humanity. You start to talk about things that are extraterrestrial or mm -hmm. inhuman or Lovecraftian, you know, and they don't, they, they're not meant to be mirrors that we hold up to see the worst inside ourselves. There's something extra. There's something external. Yeah, yeah, and I think that really comes comes through. And even just in you describing that, it, the 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 monsters you're describing used to be human. They were human at one point, and then they become more perverted, yes. e e you know, uh, exaggerated versions of exactly. these dark parts of our exactly. Our psyche. And that came up that came up a lot in my conversations with Tracy, and that was very important um, to to Tracy and Laura to sort of preserve that element, as well as this idea that everything in Barovia is basically. Um, suffering as a consequence of Strahd's deeds or actions. So there's nothing in Curse of Strahd that doesn't tie directly back to Strahd, that you can't say, this is the way it is because Strahd did this mm. or Strahd did that. Um, there, was, there were ideas that we put out there originally that we brainstormed that we could not tie to Strahd very clearly, and so we abandoned them. Mm. Um, and that, I think, also has given the adventure a lot of strength because everything points back to the same source. In a way, all the things that you see are reflecting Strahd's evil. Wow. Uh, the, only, the only one who can't see, it's, it's ironic that the only one, that, that Strahd is the only one who can't see himself. He cannot see the evil that he is, and that's his problem. Um, cause vampires do not see their own reflection. So they cannot look at themselves. Fascinating. So he, he, yeah. I mean, like every good villain, he thinks he's just doing what, what, what he needs to do in order yeah. to and survive. He, is incapable, like he is incapable of change. He's incapable of it because he can't see himself. He can only be destroyed. Yeah. So here's an idea. We've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the, the qualities of horror as well as the tropes, uh, in modern horror, um, one thing that comes to mind is that sequels are a much bigger part of the modern cinematic landscape of horror films. 
Uh, and to an extent, although, you know, um, there are some standout sequels within the horror genre that date back quite far. Um, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein being a good example. For sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm imagining a scenario where uh, a group of friends got together and played Curse of Straw when this came out in 2016. They're excited about revisiting uh, it with the Curse of Strahd revamped, what w- advice would you give to a dungeon master who doesn't want to just run the adventure again with new characters, but wants to revisit and perhaps reconnect some of the things that happened in the first campaign as a, oh. as a kind of sequel campaign using yeah. uh, this box? Uh, what, what That's are- a really interesting idea. I think it all depends on um, what the DM is... Uh, what sort of stakes the DM is willing to put in the ground. If it's going to be, uh, <laughs> as, as far as um, like, is this going to be a continuation of some previous experience? Like if you're running this adventure for a, a group of players who've been through it already, the first thing I would ask is, you know, what happened at the end, the first time they went through the adventure, if Strahd was destroyed, for instance, the question becomes, okay, you have a choice now. Do you want to bring him back? And, and contrive a means by which that could happen. For instance, there could be a cult to Strahd that is sort of gathering up his ashes or his you know, pieces or whatever and performing a ritual that will cause him to reform. Um, you know, some ancient sect has come to Barovia to see that that happens and maybe the heroes are tipped off and they have to go back into Barovia to prevent Strahd from reforming. And so suddenly you've got, a, you've got the same set pieces, but now the impetus has changed. Strahd is not an is not an existing threat. He is a potential returning threat. And what that means, so it's like a, a ticking clock. You've got to stop the, you've got to stop these cultists who have taken over Castle Ravenloft and are planning, planning to bring the master back from death. That's what's one way you could go. You could also go the idea of another creature filling the power vacuum. And this is a conversation I had with Jeremy Crawford, my colleague. Um, one of the ways that he sort of um, put the put a new light or new spin on the adventure was um, he took uh, the character of Petrina, who is one of the vampire's brides in the catacombs, who currently exists as a ghost, and had her basically step in as the new sort of lord of Castle Ravenloft uh, once Strahd fell. And so she's sort of gathering, consolidating her power um, because it was always her destiny to rule at Strahd's side. Mm, that's so, cool. That, so that's another fun take, is you could basically do a ghost story version mm-hmm. of, of Curse of Strahd, where Petrina is like possessing creatures instead of just sort of descending upon them like bats and things. Uh, so, And that's just using toys that already exist within Curse of Strahd. And I think that's the key, is finding something else to latch onto that you can then sort of elevate up and say, this is going to be the driving force of the story in Strahd's absence if he's not there, or you know, if, if Strahd is partnering with some other creature, what that would be. There's the whole element um, in Curse of Strahd of this angelic being, the abbot, who has created a golem bride for Strahd. Well, what happens if they actually get together? What if, what if one of the goals of the adventure is you have to stop the wedding? Because mm. if Strahd marries this golem-like bride, maybe something terrible will happen. You know, some some prophecy will be fulfilled and and cause Barovia to fade into the real world again, where it will suddenly become this terrifying force of evil. You know, there's all kinds of stuff to play with. I think there. That's uh, that is fun. What a cool list! Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'm hoping that inspires a lot of people to jump in uh, and uh, see what is possible with Curse of Strahd revamped. Uh, it comes out October 20th, so by the time you listen to this, it might actually be available in y- your local game store, so go check it out if you haven't already. Um, and I-, I can't wait. I mean, I-, I feel like there's so much here, and we're in the throes of Halloween anyway, so yes. why not uh, take it for a spin as a one-shot and some of the ideas that Chris mentioned, or uh, you know, ho- hopefully get inspired to, to run another campaign. Um, anything right. else on Curse of Strahd v. Vamped? Uh, there's- uh, gotta love the title, right? I do, indeed. I'd spent some time. Uh, anyway, the back cover, I wrote the back cover copy. You can bury yourself in gothic horror. Oh, there were so many puns. So many. Yeah, I'm just 
I think showing the box because I think it's important again to show the sheer size of this. Box. It's bigger than, than a bread box. Yes, definitely well, bigger than a bread box. It's it's huge. Yeah, and it's heavy. So it's it's got some heft to Carry it. That's it for, sure. for sure. Very durable. It Very looks durable. Great on your shelf. Let me tell you. <laughs> nice. Bury it underground and find it in uh, <laughs> twenty years. <laughs> You know, that would have been that would have been a great marketing uh, thing where we actually buried some boxes like around the globe and given people clues to find them. I would have, but we're not allowed to go anywhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> true, true. We would have set this up and then COVID would have descended upon us and ruined it. That was everything. totally my plan. I, but I have I have a few buried around West Seattle, so keep an eye out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be we'll be giving out clues. <laughs> <laughs> a little geocaching for yeah. Rod. You yeah. already mentioned Alki. Maybe it's down there next oh, to where you're doing your Taroka. Uh, <laughs> My readings. I like it. Yeah. I like that we're like <laughs> 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 convincing people there's an ARG happening when there is. <laughs> a, little, a little, my little side hustle. You don't know. You, you don't know. know. Now we have to do it. We backdoored ourselves <laughs> into doing it. <laughs> All That's right, awesome. Find, uh, find Greg and I. I can't wait. Thank you, Chris, for, for taking the time to talk to us about all this as well as uh, delving into fun lore around uh, vampires and, and Ravenloft. Oh. Uh, there's a lot there to get into. So uh, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to talk to you about your next project. Bum, bum, bum. Which one? There's so Only many. The Taroka deck. There are so many. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pick one. We'll see. We'll let the Taroka deck decide. Yeah. Yeah. But if Chris of Strahd does well, who knows? Maybe we'll we'll do this kind of thing again. Yeah. Okay. Tyranny of Dragons revamped. Wait, well, we already kind of did that with the uh, with the the combination. We did. we did, but maybe there's something out there. So. Yeah. Demons, bring me demons. More demon weddings. More weddings. <laughs> Zuggy. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, this is fun. As always.